This morning, I have the privilege of speaking with Lindsay Nichol. Good morning, Lindsay. How are you? Good morning. How are you, Andrew? I'm doing fantastic. I'm looking Good. forward to the conversation about teaching. Good. Glad to be here. Well, I, I appreciate you taking time out of your day, and, and, and I assume it's now your summer, right? Correct. <laughs> All right, so I, I respect teacher summers completely, so I will not uh, keep you too long. We'll, we'll hold to the 30 minutes. Uh, just for anyone joining us, uh, just so you know that um, we're gonna have uh, streaming comments. So if you have a question for Lindsay as we uh, venture into her experience becoming a teacher and inside the classroom, drop us a question. I would be happy to ask uh, Lindsay uh, if we have time uh, today. So Lindsay, I, I wanna certainly get into your classroom experience and, and uh, the lessons you've learned and can share with about teaching. But before that, I'd love just the uh, context and the background of, of how you got into teaching. Was it something you thought about for a while or did you just happen to step in it? Tell me about uh, your story into teaching. It was, uh, I ended up teaching pretty much on accident. Um, I was working in other career fields and decided to start subbing uh, at my stepdaughter's school. Uh, when uh, I met her dad, and I really liked it. Uh, so after about eight or nine years of subbing, I actually was invited to do a long-term position starting on the first day of school at the district I'm at right now. And so it was during that that I worked through iTeach and uh, actually took the test after I finished that commitment and passed it. <laughs> So um, the following school year, the teacher I had subbed for ended up uh, moving on, and I am now in that position permanently. That's fantastic. So, so you, yeah. you subbed in a position long term and then assumed that next school year, that exact same classroom? Um, yes, and I'm still there. Wow, that, that's, very, uh, that's very interesting. And, and it's not too dissimilar to other stories I've been able to hear over the past several weeks about uh, substitutes and aides being a great transition into uh, the classroom. Do you feel that the substitute teaching increased your preparation for the classroom or what was the impact of your substituting into your actual teaching uh, skill set? Um, it did significantly impact uh, my preparation for teaching because as a sub, you are given the opportunity to fill that vacancy without the commitment level of a teacher. So there's a lot of observing and getting to, you know, work the school system from a multidisciplinary perspective without uh, the paperwork. And as a sub, you're not doing parent conferences. You're not doing any of that. You are focusing on building relationships with the kids in the school, as well as, you know, what it would look like permanently for you. You know, what would, what would I do different? Or if this were mine, what would I do? And it allows you to see the school from the lunchroom, from the playground, from all of the things that you don't see just as a student getting observation hours that are, you know, sometimes only a few days. And with my subbing, it went on, you know, over eight or nine years wow. of, you know, being called and going or not being able to go because I was committed to another job at that point. But I think that that time in there made me what I am today because I could see it from every aspect without a formal commitment yet. So I could just kind of see it more relaxed. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting insight to the way you, you took your supposition. Did you know from the very beginning of your substitute kind of tenure that you were taking notes on if I was ever to be a teacher, I'd do this? Or was it later on that you were more reflective? How did you approach substituting initially? Um, initially, it was just, oh, I enjoyed it. I, I liked being there and being involved with the kids and promoting, you know, our nation's youth and their growth and just advocating for them. But it wasn't until right before that long-term position that I really thought, okay, this could become permanent. And if it does, what do I want out of it? And what do I want for the kids? And so it wasn't until years of plugging into private schools. Uh, I was at a private school subbing as well as two different public schools. And 
they're all different, but it wasn't until it got really, you know, down to the end of where this could be a permanent thing for me. What do I, how do I make the most of it while I'm not having to give a full-time commitment? What can I do right now so that when I have to, I'm prepared and I'm ready to take off and go with it. So yes, it wasn't until the end, you know, when I knew I'm going in, I'm going yeah. all in, <laughs> what do I need? So it was, it was towards the end. Yeah. So when you were a long-term sub, um, that first year, you're that long-term sub, did you have, were you day one long-term? So the first day of school, you were, yes. you were with the kids? Yes. So you have a, a unique position where you almost <laughs> got to redo your first day as a teacher yes. uh, because you had like a, a practice run at it. Yes. What, what did you learn from that? And, and then the first day of your own classroom, tell me about that and, and how, just the year prior, you had kind of a dry run. How did that impact your first day? Um, I was prepared to do nothing but sort supplies, <laughs> uh, show these kids their schedule, kind of establish the ground rules, and uh, be prepared for even some students to come in on day three and not day one. Uh, still lots of questions, forgot lunches, things like that. It was, it was a gift. Um, and that's how I see it is, okay, you're, you know, you just did this last year. Um, right. it, it was awesome. It was awesome. Yeah. Your, your story of, of having an awesome first day and first week as a new teacher, uh, certainly is not normal. And so it's <laughs> right. to, uh, the impact and, and the, really the benefits of doing that long-term position. Yes. Uh, so if anyone's listening to this thing about teaching and has the opportunity to sub, uh, there's certainly a windfall of of benefits uh, to do that. I would like to know more about that first week of school. From talking to to the teachers I've been able to talk to over the past couple of weeks, and then knowing my own disposition and other teachers, a large part of that first week of school is relationship building. And yeah. so uh, you kind of mentioned that you were doing a lot the first day, and you didn't mention any teaching. You mentioned school supplies and schedules mm -hmm. and and those things. What was your strategy? Well, first of all, do you agree that relationship building happens first? Uh, and then yes. what was your strategy, if it does, to really take that first week and optimize relationship building? Um, I think it's kind of a scaffold process. You know, they come in and you kind of start with the ground rules, but also you want to start to build that trust. Uh, in my position teaching at the time, you know, anywhere from fourth to sixth grade, year after year, you know, that first year was critical for me, but in that first week, especially when you get your new students that you haven't met before, it's, it's just that trust and letting them see that you're there for them. You have no other agenda other than I am here for you <laughs> and we're going to do this together. You know, it's, it's new for me. It's new for them. And um, it was mainly building that trust, letting them know that I had a relationship with their parents. And that uh, this wasn't, uh, really, there was no separation between school and home. You know, I'm your home away from home. So uh, let's build a relationship and get some accountability from both of us, from me and, and them. And let them, the trust is huge for me. I, when, when students trust you, they're going to work for you. So if it took us a week to do that and to let them get comfortable just where they are in their new norm for that year, then that, that was huge. Yeah, so before we dive into maybe more of your classroom, uh, for those listening in that might have questions, it might be helpful to know a little bit of the context of your teaching environment. So maybe just, can you give me a couple um, sentences of what you're teaching, what kind of school you're in, is it rural, urban, the environment, uh, those things to kind of paint a picture of where you're, you're teaching? Yes, I am. Um, I'm in Hill County. So I am south of Fort Worth about 45 minutes in a 1A school. It is a rural uh, community. And from pre-K through 12th grade, we have a little uh, right at 300 students. So we have one principal from pre-K through sixth grade. And then we have a secondary principal from seventh through 12th grade, all on one campus. So we're a family. <laughs> All of us. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's helpful, certainly, as people listen in to kind of uh, even envision that you have one campus, all grades, where they might have experienced 
a school district with eight elementaries uh, and four high schools that are all five, six A in size. Yeah. And so kind of understanding where you're teaching hopefully frames any questions uh, we might have. Uh, one of the questions I actually just, just hopped in, I think is relevant back to that first week of, of uh, teaching. You mentioned the importance of building trust, uh, mm -hmm. which I tend to agree with. And, and I'm, I'm thankful that as a parent that there's teachers uh, willing to engage at that uh, more than just educational level with kids, but on the emotional level as well. Yeah. But <clears throat> how do you do that? How do you actually gain trust? Do you have any actual resources or strategies or what's your game plan to, to really gain that trust? Um, gaining trust is one of the most difficult things. And I think it has to come from a teacher who is not just physically present in the room, but mentally present, emotionally tied and committed to what they're doing. And I think uh, for me, I spend the first week learning to know my kids, you know, and I, I use this analogy a lot. Um, I would never compare a human to an animal, but picture yourself adopting six to 10 dogs or puppies or cats at a time. Their sleeping habits, social habits, eating habits, where they come from is all different. And when you would do that, you would take each one of them and learn a little bit about them. So student conferencing, um, you can also get student inventory sheets that are free. It, many resources, teacher pay teacher. Um, it can be a little written activity, especially for your kids that are able to write um, independently that can just tell you a little bit about them. And I also send one home to the parents. There's a parent survey that allows them the opportunity to share anything they need to know, they want you to know about their, about their child. And when the child can tell that you and their parent are on the same page for them, then they, there's almost an automatic safety there. Yeah. And they know that, okay, even when I leave mom and dad, even if circumstances are not great at home, they know they're gonna be taken care of. And so at student inventories and questionnaires, you know, you can spend two or three minutes just giving students individual attention and learn a whole lot about them because they want to talk to you. They want to tell you everything. Yeah. So yeah. I think uh, letting them see that you're going to give them that time, even if it's only a few minutes, is just the beginning. But allow, not rushing them. And that's hard. But don't rush them. Let, let them tell you everything. And you may not hear it again for a couple weeks. But let them talk to you and open up. So building that relationship and trust just on a human level usually is a two-way street, right? Uh, so you can't just typically ask a fellow human to provide all this information. Sure. As a teacher, how do you enter into modeling that and, and uh, being relational back to a student, given their age, given your position as a, a yeah. teacher, where, where do you, uh, or how do you navigate that in terms of relationship building from, from your end? Sure. Um, uh, a lot of times it helps them when they can kind of compare you to them. And I, I talk about my dogs and I talk about what we like to eat and my kids, they're also on campus there in school. Um, I send home a letter to parents just giving an introduction about me so they know who I am. And I think it's important that they do, they want to know about you. And I don't have anything to hide for them. I mean, we become a big family. So we talk about everything. We talk about what our hobbies are. Um, we talk about how we handle serious situations, how we handle funny situations. There's a lot of, uh, obviously a lot of emotions that go into school. Yeah. And we talk about how we work through those and we, we role play. And uh, just letting them see a little bit of you will help them open the door to sharing more information about themselves. So going on that theme about sharing information about themselves and, and that learning, obviously as a teacher, your, your primary and, and paid profession is to impact student learning. For them to actually gain knowledge uh, and sure. in Texas, uh, it has to be to the TEAK standards and there might even be state um, exams at the end of the year. That's obviously um, kind of in the job description of teaching. What might not be in the job description of teaching is the cultiva cultivation of emotion and, and uh, social um, awareness and those things. And so 
I would, I would love just to pick your brain about where do you find that balance? And especially maybe even in a smaller context where you probably see your kids all the time. You'll see them the next year on campus for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you might see them around, around your town if it's a 1A uh, district. Where, where's the balance for teachers from content to understanding that you're training up the next generation of leaders? Um, social emotional learning is really my number one focus. Um, and I try to do that simultaneously when, you know, when considering academics, cause like you said, that's the, num- that's, that's the state's number one priority for me. Yep. Um, but we, t- we talk a lot of just about our character in passing and in the lunchroom. And when I eat with the kids at lunch, you know, uh, talk about our manners and then, you know, if we kind of get off task in the classroom, I'll bring those in and say, hey, when this happened, you know, what should we do? And we, you know, talk about respect. It's, it's just a whole child approach to teaching. Right. So I think you can stick to those objectives while meeting their needs. And it's a difficult task. It's not something that comes overnight. But we uh, do a lot of affirmation within the class. I mean, sometimes our last five minutes, students uh, are given the opportunity to write each other words of affirmation. And then every Friday they can read them to each other. I mean, everybody kind of has that lingering three to four minutes at the end of class where you're cleaning supplies and things like that, or in the hallway in passing, you know, if you're at your door waiting on your next group of students, talk to them in the hall as they're getting their things out of their locker, you can take advantage of time. And, you know, you don't have to, you know, just have a lull talk to the kids, uh, talk about character traits, compliment them. If they answer a question and they really knew what they were doing, say, wow, you were really focused. You know, uh, is there anything else you would like to share? And just giving the kids a voice and teaching good listening, modeling good listening um, can be done while teaching the content. And also I allow my students to, we have classroom rules, but we also have a social contract that the students come up with social, uh, socially acceptable norms. You know, what's appropriate in the hall? While somebody's getting their things out of their locker, do you just walk by and slam it shut? No, you, you go around or you let them have the time that they need. And the fact that they come up with their socially acceptable norms puts them um, an active part of the community we're trying to grow here. Yeah, I mean, that, that's really good information. and. I imagine you can confirm this, but but that type of social emotional engagement most likely plays benefits into the actual learning as well. They're not disconnected yes. at all. Right, they're a family. I mean, the kids are a family, and I had I had one group of students I'm I'm promoting this year, um, but I had them for three years, and there was thirty of them. Wow. And um, we they were my first group as fourth graders, and. Uh, we just, from day one, we targeted character, we targeted respect, and with a group of 30 to 33 over three years, you had to have that. We could not function without that, and I mean, no learning would happen if there was not respect and collaboration as a team within that classroom, and they got to where they would correct each other, and I wouldn't even have to say anything, and it, it was just, it was awesome, and and as much as academics is a priority, you can't get anywhere without your classroom being a team. And so that is, that is my number one thing. I mean, we start that and we spend a couple weeks talking about character while I'm introducing new material. Yeah. I mean, that's really valuable. And I know just from seeing all the likes popping up on the Facebook live, you're getting a lot of support uh, for, for that type of, of teaching perspective kind of going into kind of the current situation, you mentioned the importance of this teamwork and the social emotional, and then come March, we all get just surprised by a complete shutdown. In Texas, where we're both at, governor shut down schools pretty quickly. How, how was it, or tell me about the challenges to remain engaged as a team via the virtual platforms that you had access to, and what was that like? Um, it, it was good. My experience was good. Um, the fact that I had built a good relationship with the parents and the students, um, this year I taught fifth and sixth grade. And so my fifth graders actually had his fourth graders last year. 
And then my sixth graders I had had through fourth and fifth grade. So we know each other really well. And I, I communicated with them on Google Classroom. I allowed them to participate um, in a little forum there where they could talk and have discussion topics. And I also use Class Dojo. So that allowed me to not only just talk with the students, but continue to build that relationship with the parents. And I think for me, it was a really good experience. I, I didn't, fe I felt physically disconnected, yeah. but we were not emotionally or mentally disconnected. I mean, we were still just as close. In fact, some of the parents that I hadn't built as good of a relationship with, it gave me that opportunity and I took it because some of these I will have again, you know, my fifth graders, I will have again next year as sixth graders. Right. And I thought, okay, I'm going to have them again. And some of these parents I haven't heard from, you know, in two years since I've had their child and I was talking to them for the first time. So as unfortunate as it was to lose the constant contact with the kids, it really allowed a growth with the parents. And I will gladly do that anytime, but the kids, um, a lot of the kids' parents had uh, individual child uh, Facebook Messenger permissions, and I did allow that. Any of them that had a question while mom and dad were at work, you know, I didn't want them to have to wait till they came home to get my help. So I was available. We, our school was extremely flexible. We have the best administration. Um, they said, you know, we only have such and such hours of expectations for you. The rest is beyond that, you know, that's up to you. But I just made myself available. And I think by doing that, it, it made it much easier. And when I was able to turn in work completion at the end of the grading period, everybody did it. I mean, and that's huge for two full grade levels. I, I didn't have anybody that didn't do it. Yeah, that, that definitely is uh, impressive and uh, not the norm uh, to have that type of engagement <clears throat> during uh, the shutdown. I've talked to a lot of teachers and, and, and different parts of, of the country even, and there's been a varied response. And so uh, kudos to you for setting the infrastructure that, that helps support that going into a really uh, surprising and unknown time of teaching. Before I, I kind of get to some other questions, I just want to remind anyone on uh, Facebook right now, uh, if you have any questions for Lindsay, uh, please just drop them in the comments. We'll do our best to answer those. We have about five more minutes or so uh, remaining. And, and if you have questions, uh, drop them in. We'll do our best to, to ask of that. Um, one of the things that you had said, Lindsay, that, that resonated with me is uh, the, the relationships you had already formed with the parents. And I think one of the things that I just took away from that is the importance that parents play into even the unknown. No one last year predicted that we were going to have eight weeks or 10, however long it's been of, of shutdown. So certainly you were not building relationships with parents for the purpose of being able to maintain virtual communication. Right. <laughs> but because you invested in that time, regardless of what situation comes up inside or outside the classroom, you already have a support system in place. Right. And so uh, it's just a good takeaway that going in for new teachers or even current teachers that don't do it, the benefits we might even not even know uh, that could be there for relationship building uh, with the parents. Right. One of the questions that I, I had is you talked about fifth and sixth grade. Mm -hmm. Where, what's the difference between those two grades? Obviously there's different prep in terms of content, but do you see a massive difference in maturity or uh, social engagement between those grades or are they are they kind of the same I'm not I don't remember my fifth and, and sixth grade years <laughs> they are very different um, the fifth graders are still kind of functioning at a lower elementary level until around Christmas and every year at Christmas <laughs> I get lots of parents, oh, you know, they think they need to have a parent conference. What is going on with my child? <laughs> Said nothing. <laughs> this happens every year at Christmas in fifth grade. So I typically see a change um, every year at Christmas with fifth grade. But then by sixth grade at Christmas, I really have students that are ready for junior high. And it's it seems cyclical. I don't have a lot of years in this yet, but the years that I do have, it's been the same every year. So when I get them at the beginning of fifth grade, 
they still want me to be mom. They want, they want to tell me everything. They want to know everything about me. Um, they want to talk about their new pets or what's happening for their birthday or where they're going by Christmas. Um, they're the boss and they tell everyone else how it's going. <laughs> but I see when they come back as sixth graders, there's a little bit less of that. And then the closer we get to Christmas of sixth grade, um, they're a whole new group of kids. And that sixth grade year, it is like a golden year to me. Mm. I love sixth graders. Um, it's a golden year. They, they transition from going that preteen stage to wanting to please you. They start looking at what they need to do to be successful. And so it is hard. Uh, the content is not a lot different, especially with science, because that's what I teach. But the maturity level is much different. And I think that's been good, though, because I've been with all of them through it. And then they see they get me again the following year. And they thought, hey, we survived. Yeah. So. Sure. It's, a, it's much different, but I would tell any parent or any teacher, you'll see a change at Christmas and just be ready for it and support them. That's, that's what I did. I supported them. I don't know how many times there were so many tears and frustrations and we just got through it. And that's where the parent relationships, that social emotional learning and teaching that self-awareness uh, up front and that character and, and how to support your peers uh, is so important. But yes, they do change at Christmas, but just be there, be a listener, talk them through it and uh, be on their side because it does get better. Well, I think uh, a lot of teachers can be encouraged by that. I'm also interested to know, and in my mind, before I asked that question, I was thinking there is a delineation because a lot of fifth graders move campuses for sixth grade, especially yes. in Texas. Sixth grade is is momentous shift because they're actually into middle school and, and there's yes. a, a catalyst that shifted but you're even saying that it's mid fifth grade and your students don't change campuses so it's no. not an external uh change within them it, it's it's an age and maturity that's happening independent of any kind of outside uh you know classifications being put on them mm -hmm. which which is it's kind of surprising to me and interesting to hear yes and i actually as a sixth grader i was still in elementary and I didn't, I was not a student where I teach. I was in another district, but even as a sixth grader, I was in elementary and our, um, when they go to seventh grade, they do go the cafeteria and one of our gyms is between the primary and secondary campuses. So they're not interacting with each other after sixth grade. They gotcha. do, they do split. It's a different group of teachers. Um, but it really makes you think about if they're really ready or not after fifth grade to move on. Yeah. And I don't think they are. I think uh, there's a lot there um, that those sixth graders are not ready to be a part of in middle school. I think keeping them in elementary kind of still keeps that safe bubble around them because it's a very awkward stage developmentally for them. You know, some of them still are the size of a fourth or fifth grader, but then some are the size of an eighth grader. Yeah. So by keeping them through the end of sixth grade before we send them on, they're ready. I mean, we can we send them over there confidently knowing they're going to be fine. Yeah, that's an interesting kind of uh, maybe educational political take. I yeah. tend to agree with you. I know my, my youth, uh, elementary was the sixth grade. Our junior high was seventh, eighth and went to high school. Yes. Uh, but even in, in the district I'm in now, our middle school encompasses sixth, seventh and eighth. And so it's interesting to, to hear your thoughts on just the way uh, schools and districts kind of bifurcate out those grades. Uh, maybe some people of influence are, are listening today and can, <laughs> can hear what you're saying. So I, I know I, we asked for 30 minutes of your time and, and I thank you so much for yeah. the time you've given us it's been almost a tradition now after six weeks just to let you have the final word. And, and what I try to do is just frame a question to you like this. If we have individuals thinking about becoming a teacher watching this, what would you tell them about the future of teaching, the, the purpose of teaching and uh, encouragement into them getting into the teaching profession? Um, you hear a lot of negativity. You hear a lot of, um, working overtime, you know, underpayment, and 
you know, a lot more work than what you're compensated for and difficult parents. And I think that that's great, but until you've done it, you know, and invested everything you have from different, you know, from different aspects, I think you should try because it's, you get out of it what you put in. And there's unfortunately certain times where administration is just not on your side. But where I have been, they have supported me beyond 100% since I was a sub. And sometimes just a change. So if you're not happy, sometimes just a change. But I think we need good teachers. And even if you've never thought about it, it, it might call on you. And that's what happened to me. And when it does, you, you go. And it's, it's definitely not easy, but if you manage your time correctly, you will work an eight hour day and go home. I don't take anything home. So uh, make the most of your time there. That's sure. what, that's my best piece of advice. And that was given to me by one of my mentor teachers. And it, it just prevents burnout. It prevents so many things and keeps you recharged and refreshed for the next day. Yeah, I think we can all uh, kind of use that piece of advice. I know for me and, and during COVID, the, the day hours kind of got blurred and it's helpful yeah. to, to have a, a time which you're on and you're, and you're loving those kids deeply and, and teaching them. But teachers have to be uh, prioritizing rest and uh, that work-life balance uh, to make sure that the energy levels are high every day. And so yes. that's, a, that's a good word of encouragement and um, strategies for teachers. Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I, I, we're out of time, but I appreciate what you did give of your summer. I hope your summer's safe and healthy and that you're thank back you. in a brick and mortar classroom this fall. I uh, love it on those kids. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Andrew.